Hello everyone, this is Alex from Games. Today I'm with Sean Black from Ravencoin. is the lead dev and also president of the Ravencoin Foundation. How are you doing, Tron? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Great, great. Uh, it's very... Uh, I'm quite excited uh, because we don't hear uh, about Ravencoin uh, every day. So, and it's quite a high market cap. So, very... Could you please give us a, a high level overview of what it is? Uh, yeah, Ravencoin. So yeah, sure. Uh, originally, it was a code fork of Bitcoin, not a chain fork, but a code fork. Uh, we improved some parameters, uh, runs one minute blocks, uh, two, uh, two megabyte blocks, uh, launched on Raven, uh, around Bitcoin's ninth birthday. And then uh, that same year, later that same year, we added the ability for you to create your own token on top of Ravencoin. So for people who are familiar with either open assets or Omni Master Coin, um, projects like that counterparty, uh, we, we basically took that same concept, put the put everything together into one uh, one blockchain. That's Ravencoin. Right. So it's a fork of Bitcoin, but there's also some Ethereum since you can create tokens. So the ability to create a token is just something that that uh, you know, like, is a lot of what Ethereum does, but it's really just a smart contract. Uh, and what we've done is just built that in without smart contracts, just built that into, into the Ravencoin DNA. So the ability to create a, uh, create a token is just built in there. There isn't a smart contract. You can just go, you have to pick a unique name, how many you want, how divisible they are, and whether you want to be able to make more in the future. Uh, so whether it's reissuable and you can attach data to it. So what the token means, and then you hit go and it creates a token. Um, so it's, it's all built in. All right, so what are some cool projects built outside of Ravencoin, but using maybe Ravencoin tokens? More interesting ones is Raventrader.net and RVN, so RVN like Raven, uh, Ravenbay.com. And so that's kind of an NFT platform. And then, and then uh, Raventrader.net is kind of a way to kind of do atomic swaps on the chain for doing Raven for, for different assets. Cool, sounds interesting. Um, yeah. But also sounds like something you could maybe do on Ethereum. So why, yeah. maybe that's kind of a, a rough question, but why should yeah. people care about Raven uh, no, when there's already yeah. Ethereum? That's, that's a great question. So Ethereum does use smart contracts. Uh, right now, Ethereum is running, uh, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of times more expensive to kind of transfer and move things around. That's, that's I mean, that's... Among other reasons, uh, one of the reasons that, that you might do that. The other thing that, that's interesting about Ravencoin and, and distinguishes it from the ERC-20 contract that's on Ethereum is the, the unique name. So when you, when you create a token, uh, you have to choose a unique name. And uh, the system kind of handles the, you know, resolving that, making sure that you're the only one that gets that name. Uh, so you get unique, your unique name. So it's like getting a domain name, right? You know, usually in the domain name space, there's a registry, a centralized registry, et cetera. Uh, there's a built-in registration system uh, in built into Ravencoin. So that, that's one thing that distinguishes it. Another one is you can attach data to it. So what is this token about? Uh, and typically in the ERC-20 world, it's like what, what that token is about uh, is oftentimes left to just a website or you know something like that, that you have to go kind of figure out, uh, and then because it doesn't have the unique naming system, you know, a lot of times you have uh, just a contract ID, so it's like forty character unique identifier. It's basically a hash of the instance of the contract that is your unique identifier, but that's easily spoofed. You know, someone can't duplicate that that hash ID, but someone could say, "Oh, we're that same token," without really being that same token, and and because you have a unique name within Ravencoin that a lot of times solves a lot of problems. There was no pre-mine, right? Uh, yeah. Ravencoin is something uh, maybe fairer than Bitcoin with uh, yeah. uh, an initial distribution that's less skewed toward very early adopters. Yes. Uh, yeah, so there were early adopters, but it was a lot of them. So a lot of people jumped in mine, but there was no pre-mine. So there was nothing where you said, uh, you know, oh, the, there's a whole bunch of tokens set aside initially, and then it's like, okay, we're gonna have these tokens now. You guys start, nothing like that. Uh, there was no, you know, a Genesis block we put in tokens that belong to, to the developers that didn't exist. Um, there was nothing where we ran the ran the mining for a long time without telling anybody that didn't exist. So, and there was no ICO potentially in some, you know, legal limbo. 
Um, and so we didn't have any of that. So that, that was super helpful. And I, you know, I credit uh, some of the people behind the project who spent and things like that for kind of knowing the rules and to kind of make sure it was fair launch. So let me ask you then, no ICO, no fundraising, no tokens yeah. set for yourself. How did they get funded? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So it was actually funded uh, from uh, some from a division of Overstock.com uh, called Medici Ventures, uh, which is a venture firm that was inside uh, inside Overstock. Uh, that's now been dissolved. It's now kind of a financial fund. Uh, but at the time, for about the first we'll call it about first three years of Ravencoin's existence, uh, the team was funded through that through that. And also, I'm assuming there's still some kind of core team that has some kind of, uh, maybe not control, but more legitimacy and, you know, people listen to them more. In addition to a whole bunch of other people, uh, it has uh, the ability to kind of watch over the, the GitHub repo, because you can't just open that to everybody. People could put in you know, uh, dangerous things. So I, I wouldn't call it a point of control, uh, I'd call it a point of uh, monitoring and things like that so that so that uh, lots of people are watching that uh there is no uh core team there is no like developers that are being paid specifically for this other than bounties volunteers things like that um and, and it's working uh which is really nice so so we've hit this level of maturity where where it's very very decentralized uh there's also it's broken up now into uh what we call SIGs, uh, special interest groups so there's a there's a special interest group for uh, Electrum, for example, special interest group for Core, special interest group for uh, another wallet that's being built. Um, and so these special interest groups have uh, the social media channels, uh, for example, Reddit, Telegram, um, Discord, etc., are being run by volunteers. So there is no uh, people kind of controlling that. Um, we, yeah, so it, it's, it's a very unique project in that regard. Um, you guys have halvings, just like Bitcoin. Correct. We, we have halvings. Uh, the halving schedule, uh, even though we sped up the number of blocks and things like that, the halving, uh, the number of blocks before the halving was also kind of, uh, was was increased. You know, so uh, we're, the blocks run 10 times faster, but the halving, you know, is 10 times as many blocks. So it's roughly still four years. Uh, so our first halving should be, you know, last time we calculated, should be around January 10th of next year. And also something quite exciting about the mining is that it's uh, more profitable than Ethereum and also maybe ASIC resistant. Is that correct? Yeah. So our original goal was to be ASIC resistant. Um, so there was, a, there was an algorithm uh, called X16R, which was 16 algorithms, but every, it would, it would, instead of, uh, if you're familiar with like Dash's mining, it used 11 and basically chained them all together. And then uh, somebody created X13, which is 13 chained together. And somebody created X15, it was 15 chained together. We did X16, but instead of chaining together in the same order, we did X16R for random. And so the, the order of the algorithms changed every time, but it needed to be deterministic, meaning everybody needed to be doing the same order, even if it changed. And so the previous block, which is essentially random, or parts of it are essentially random, the last uh, eight bytes of that determine the order of the algorithms uh, in X16. So that was originally uh, the ASIC resistant plan for uh, for for Ravencoin. So that lasted uh, probably about uh, well originally with mined on on PCs uh, or you know desktops, laptops, etc. I don't know. It wasn't very long, maybe three or four months into it, uh, they had done a kind of a hybrid uh, GPU thing where they had some algorithms on on the computer and some algorithms that were faster on the on GPU. And then pretty soon it became GPU. Do you have any idea on what revenue coin might become? I guess, again, it might be hard just because as you mentioned, everyone can participate. So if there's someone who has yeah. a very cool idea, it might just take it somewhere uh, that wasn't predicted. But um, yeah. how do you see, I guess, maybe crypto evolve? And do you have some ideas yourself of what revenue coin could become? Yeah, so, so one thing Ravencoin is particularly good at is, is uh, someone creating an asset that represents uh, something. And that, that can be uh, sort of like a gift card or in the case of the, the wine futures, things like that. So they create the token and now they can send it to people and it represents that. And then they can, because of the features of Ravencoin, they can document really well what the, what the 
what it represents. Meaning, you know, if you said, hey, this represents an hour of my time, you can make a little PDF that says, hey, this is an hour of my time. I just sent you a token. You can redeem it with me uh, anytime you want. Extending from there, uh, there's all kinds of other people doing things where, you know, potentially tokens that, that represent uh, companies and water rights and, and all kinds of things. Show the power of it. And, and then as other examples, we'll show this and then other people go, oh, well, I could do this, right? And, and it just kind of grows from there. Um, so that, that, that's kind of, we built the platform. It's, it's you know, been running 24-7, uh, 365 for, for, you know, three and a half years now. Uh runs great and and so people can now build on top of it do you guys have like a biz dev team that just you know does reach out and uh, i would say maybe i guess the more general question is how do you view the competitiveness of a decentralized team with volunteers contributors compared yep. to a traditional company yeah so the, the easiest way to think about this might be uh might be sort of bitcoin versus eos right uh, EOS raised a ton of money. Uh, they, you know, they, 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 you know, has some interesting technology, etc. Um, but, but it's a different animal. And, and I think Raven Coins fits a very specific thing: super decentralized. You can create tokens super easy. It's, it's like it's cheap, fast, easy to use, um, and it's there, and it's, and it's running, and it's solid. Uh, but you're, you're not going to get somebody on the phone telling, telling you you should use it. It, it, it just isn't that type of project. It's more more like Bitcoin, like word of mouth, uh, you know, eventually spread, and 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 then it it'll probably find some niches in certain things. So where do you yeah. place the cursor between decentralization, freedom, and control? Yep. And are there people in power trying to kind of game the system? Uh, I'm going to say yes. So I, I agree that 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 is the danger. Uh, if you look at my Facebook profile, you know, first thing it says freedom ad- advocate. So so that that's my mentality, and I do I do think that that having uh, money that's kind of uh, uncensorable is part part of freedom. I think we have way too much surveillance of our existing financial system. I mean, the more people knew how surveilled we were, there would be an uprising about it i just don't think that that they do and in fact there's even stuff kind of written in to kind of prevent people to from figuring it out because i think the people that wrote it also realized that there would be an uprising if they knew how surveilled cool um is there anything else you'd like to mention about raven coin or crypto anything um i, I love the entire space uh i'm not a, i'm not a bitcoin maximalist i think the the whole space uh, is incredible. I love how it's connecting together, meaning these bridges between all the platforms. Um, it's programmable money, and and you know as we know and we've seen with you know the internet versus newspapers, with you know uh, uh, Blockbuster versus Netflix. The, the the idea that something's programmable, digital, uh, it just it it has so much potential in so many uh, ways it can grow. I'm really excited about it. All right, cool. Uh, well, for those who want to learn more about Ravencoin, the links will be in the description. Uh, to be honest, it sounds like a, a fun project, uh, you know, like Bitcoin V3. So if you miss Bitcoin, yeah. maybe, you know, uh, here's your chance with Ravencoin, who knows? Um, and yeah, thanks, Tron, for coming in. Um, I guess people, if you want to chat with Tron, write a comment. If you have a question, something, I'm sure um, you'll check them out in a few days. And uh, drop a like, share the video around if you're a Ravencoin fan, just a crypto fan, and just, you know, looking to educate people. And uh, on that note, uh, signing off and see you for more amazing interviews very soon.